turns out it's a good thing to have the head of Alexa at your tech conference. We were backstage and he told Alexa to turn on the lights and the lights Low came on. Um, you know, in preparation for this, I've been asking people, just anecdotally, um, if they use Alexa. I'm assuming that you use Alexa? I do, yeah. Um, in spades, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I would love a show of hands of who has an Alexa and who makes use of it on a daily basis. Thank you for being customers. That's great. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I've always been intrigued by is that there is a disparity between the people who, who use something like Alexa and those who don't. And sometimes those who don't have a skewed view of it. Um, you know, you see TVs during the Super Bowl where it almost seems like a sentient being. And the reality is that, is that it's very good, essentially, at, at answering commands. Um, to what extent are people using it beyond that? I mean, they turn on the lights, uh, they set an alarm. Beyond those sort of basic commands, to what extent are people using it? Yeah, we, we think of uh, Alexa and sort of a voice assistant as a different type of user interface, not replacing other ones, but adding something. Uh, we call it an ambient user interface inside of Amazon. And what it, uh, where it has gained the most traction, and I, I would call it at scale now, it's, uh, it's certainly large enough to be at scale, that it, it gets the most traction where it makes your life more convenient. Uh, we started with the home, we're now adding the car. And you know the lights are a good example, which is uh, you know we've had smart home for decades. I've been fooling around with it, but by the time you pull out your phone and unlock it and find the right app and find the right room in the app and you know hit the on switch, at that point you might as well just get off the couch and use the pretty good switch on the wall. But voice uh, was less friction. You just said Alexa, turn on the lights, and even though as you said it's a little transactional. It was delightful and convenient. It's quick. It's very quick. And, and music was the same way. We've brought music back to the house again in, in many ways because it's just much more convenient to have it play music than what it took to link to a Bluetooth speaker. And now that all that being said, do we need to make her more conversational and less transactional over time? Yes. We have you know thousands of people working on just that right now. Do you keep stats or share stats on? Um, how usage progresses over time, meaning are there people who buy the device, um, you know, there's, there's sort of a wow factor initially, but then as time goes on, they, they use it less. Do you see that much? There, there's definitely a peak in the first couple days. You know, there's a novelty factor to it, and people want to try out what she can do, what she can't do. They test the limits of the technology, uh, and then it levels off. But once it levels off, it stays at a very high level. Um, you know, they, we... And, and the vast majority of Echoes that we have sold are still in use today, uh, you know, and they get, they get turned on very quickly, and that's unusual in consumer electronics. Lots of them do find their way to drawers and generally in consumer electronics, and that's kind of an anomaly with uh, Echo and Alexa. And so we do see that people find often very different things, but they find things that become habitual to them. And those become the kind of mainstream, uh, you know, uh, high watermark that everybody then can use. And, they, and, and then the family catches on. Right. So it's usually one person that starts with it. It's a gift or, some, or they buy it because uh, they're curious. And then uh, the family, it, it becomes sort of addictive within the family that everybody wants to try to use it. And they all find, again, their right kind of things that they love to use about, about Alexa. You mentioned the family. I've often wondered if, if um, children um, who don't necessarily have a, as much experience as, say, I do in a world without cell phones, who are sort of dropped into this world where Alexa and similar devices exist, if they are more likely to use it than, than others in the family? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's one of these things that it becomes your new normal. That's true. I grew up in a world where I always had ch television and my parents didn't. Right. Uh, but so television's always been my new normal. It was learned behavior for them. And uh, I, a good example is I have children, and uh, you can imagine our house uses Alexa in a lot of ways. And when they go to their friend's house for a sleepover or for a visit, and they say, Alexa, turn on the lights, and it doesn't work, they're stunned because it's their new normal. They expect that to work. Works in every room of our house. And so, but it's not uh, one demographic that it's taking off with it. You know, certainly kids love it, uh, but 
I would say, I mentioned this to you earlier, that you know, I, I, at least once a week, often every day, I get a, a mail from somebody who's just, that Alexa and Echo has changed their lives because they might not have all their mobility. They might be a, a little elderly, and they find companionship with Alexa. They find the ability to interact in ways they couldn't before uh, because, again, they might have a disab disability in some ways. And so the, the, it's a very horizontal traction that, that we're seeing both Echo and Alexa getting. You mentioned companionship. That's an, that's an interesting word. To what extent are people conversing with the device in that way? And to what extent are they really getting a response? Um, to what extent does it feel like a companion? That seems like that's going to be a... Uh, yeah. a short-lived relationship to me. And, and, uh, it's, it's surprisingly not, and uh, it's uh, and uh, in some ways, sometimes timing, uh, being lucky in business is, is, is as good as being skillful, and we were not the first voice assistant to be created. They, they were on phones for a long time, and they were around. Uh, we, all, we use many of those, uh, and those went down a path which I would have done had we built uh, something for a phone that they're very utilitarian. You know, they about dictation and command and control and navigation. We, we got to start with a blank whiteboard. And one of the things that we decided from the very beginning, the team decided from the very beginning, was to embody Alexa with a sense of personality. And that personality is, uh, you know, is, is uh, reinforced by us thinking about, well, what, what kind of uh, entity is she and how, how does she react? And that personality is reflected in her answers. And it was there from the beginning and it continues to get larger and larger, the corpus of what she can do around that personality. So when people do interact with her on the more uh, emotive levels uh, and ask her to interact that way, uh, she's, very, she's pretty good at it. She has opinions, for example. I, you know, if you ever go to a dinner party devoid of opinions, it's a terribly boring dinner party. Uh, but as soon as people bring up their favorite sports team or politics, interesting conversation ensues. And similarly, Alexa is embodied with opinions for exactly that reason. Got it. Um, we did a, 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 you know, a kind of an ad hoc test at the Times last summer. It's, it's still difficult to do real back and forth conversation, but you run something called the Amazon Alexa Prize, where you invite academics and, and other researchers to come together and, um, and essentially compete to build a conversational system. So that's clearly um, where you want to take this, right? You want to have more of a back and forth, um, you know, string of not, not just questions and answers, but dialogue. Is that fair? Absolutely. The, you know, uh, we, we learn from the first days of our lives how to begin uh, having a conversation. We can't articulate it, but your brains, human brains, brain, uh, human brains are wired this way. They're very, very good at learning languages and learning natural language and syntax. And uh, as an industry, we are getting better with that, with AI and machine learning and deep learning. Uh, but we have a ways to go. But the goal would be that the uh, assistant uh, of your choice would have exactly the same kind of, kind of conversation that we're having right here. You mentioned machine learning. Um, I'm not sure how, probably in this audience people realize it, but maybe not the average person, that even with the conversational um, aspect of this, that it is learned behavior, meaning you're, you're collecting data and you're building systems that can learn certain behaviors from, from that data. Um, explain, at least to this audience, what data you are collecting as the average person uses their Alexa, um, where it's stored, uh, how, how long it's stored, and then how exactly you use that to improve the device. Yeah, uh, well, we, uh, we don't collect any data until after the word Alexa is said and the blue light goes on. So the first protection we put in place for privacy for customers is make sure while you're in your home every day, that if you're saying something that, that is in front of the wake word, none of that data ever gets captured, stored, we have no access to it. When you do say Alexa and that blue light goes on, for the, until you pause, we stream that utterance, we call it, up to the cloud and we store that encrypted, much like we would encrypt your credit card. It's in the same level of storage inside of Amazon. And we use that to train the algorithm, uh, the, the, effectively those utterances to tra train the algorithms. Uh, over time, we'll need less and less of that data as we can use other techniques like transfer learning and unsupervised learning. But today, to get the kind of progress we're making, we still do need that corpus of data. But there's, we also recognize that the customer has to come first. So we, we, from the very beginning, we, we uh, sort of set new ground on this. 
is we give control to customers of the data. You can delete, if you messed up and said something you didn't want Amazon to have or anybody else to, uh, you know, in, in, in Amazon to see in, in, the, in the case, you can delete those individual utterances or there's a big delete all button too. If you want to delete everything that we've ever stored from that device, you can just delete it. And, uh, and once that happens, we don't have access to it. How many people actually do that? There's been a lot of discussion today about the fact that you know, other tech giants um, gather enormous amounts of data. That, 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 that data doesn't shrink. It continues to grow over time. Um, people do not necessarily pay attention to, to, to privacy statements. They don't necessarily take the time to delete their data. Is that really happening? It is happening. Uh, and I would say that it, it, it's our job to make sure that we make it visible, too, as an industry. right? Uh, so um, you know, I, I, I think uh, with GDPR happening in, in Europe, uh, this, uh, we were able to launch an Alexa privacy page that we were able to take everywhere. We maybe should have done that earlier, to be honest with you. So we, uh, but I think that we can make that more. We can make this visible to customers and make sure that they uh, they have access to it. Well, over time, according to your latest numbers, you sold a hundred million devices that use Alexa, mm -hmm. um, and at least third-party studies indicate that can just continues to go up. Can you continue to do that kind of thing at scale? Um, you know, one of the flaws of artificial intelligence is that it, it can't necessarily deal. Um, you know, even on a social network, um, with, with, that, with that kind of stuff at these enormous scales that we're reaching. And, you know, if, if things continue, you're going to reach that kind of scale. Yeah, uh, I think that we can, can uh, I should never, are we going to learn as we go along? Yes. And are there things that we're going to have to adapt to quickly? And right. the key, Reed was just here, but key is quickly. Uh, but I do think that the technology is moving fast enough that we can build delightful things for customers at scale. I'm, I'm very convinced that, that you know, what seemed like science fiction in the speech industry 10 years ago, even five years ago, is now you can see it in the labs. And, uh, and again, that doesn't mean we don't have to think about privacy as an industry and we have to think about how we're going to use this as an industry, but I, I am very optimistic that, uh, that we can do this at scale. Okay. You're with Amazon, I'm with the New York Times. I have to ask about New York and Amazon. <laughs> um, so Questions? tell me, oh. <laughs> which, which way is it? Is, is Amazon sort of cowering in the face of New York City politics or is Amazon pulling out to Teach New York a lesson. What can you tell me about this? I, I wasn't super close to the specifics, to be fair, uh, but I can say that you know we're dis I, disappointed. We're disappointed as a company. I can tell you, as a leader at Amazon, I'm disappointed. I, I wanted to hire a lot of people, and we'll still hire people in New York, but I wanted to bring a headquarters there. And I think the you know from all the surveys, we saw 70 percent of of uh, you know the New Yorkers thought it was a good thing for us to come, but inevitably, you have to get a coalition of people that are going to make it a positive experience. And that just didn't come to fruition. And, and it, it's, a, it's a shame. And, but the, 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 the side that we're going to focus on moving forward is the positive side of this, which is we still have to hire 25 to 50,000 people over the coming years. And we're going to do that in Northern Virginia. We're going to do that in Nashville. And we're going to do it in the 17 other major critical sites we have in, in the United States that we're hiring talented people. And uh, I think we're going to look forward to doing that. How much of that is about engineering talent and specifically the talent you need to build this type of device? You know, there's been a lot written over the past few years about there being a shortage of so called AI talent building these types of systems that learn on their own uh, is very different than building um, systems in the past. Can you find that talent in a place like Nashville, um, in DC? What, was it even available in New York? I think, you know, you want, uh, when you think about where you want to hire people and where you want to put uh, facilities, you're thinking about uh, a lot less about what gets written about subsidies and those kinds of things. You're, you really care about hiring people is the talent there to be hired? And then will, do they want to live there? Will they stay in that place? And, uh, and uh, you know, that's why we have a lot of people here in the Bay Area, a lot of people in Seattle. People like to live there. You can attract the talent. And uh, you, I think the, 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 we've definitely been at a situation where there have been 
a lot more jobs for people that understand deep learning, machine learning, data scientists than have, uh, than have been candidates out there. However, the good news on that is that the university system is now adapting curriculums. And so what you see coming through the university systems now, the average computer scientist is learning those things. She knows those kinds of techniques, those algorithms. And so as we get graduating classes coming out now, they're much more averse in these technologies. We have to do less internal training, and, uh, and that's going to start paying even more dividends as those classes matriculate. One final question before we open it up to the audience. Alexa was seeded in part by an acquisition in Cambridge, England. Um, you've opened various other um, uh, labs across Europe. How much of this is, is built overseas? Uh, well, we, uh, the, what we bought in Cambridge was Evie, and that's sort of the seed of our uh, knowledge graph. If you ask her a question and she answers it, uh, that came from originally that team. There's still a super talented team there. We have a large team in Poland in a company we also bought called Ivona, and they do our text-to-speech engine. So when you hear Alexa talk, uh, it is that team making that voice sound natural and, and easy to understand. And then uh, we have teams in India. It's not European content, uh, but we have teams in India as well. So we're pretty global in terms of where we go to try to find the talent that uh, makes up that which is Alexa. And that, I, I imagine, will continue. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if over 10,000 people working on it, you've got to go almost everywhere. Let's take a couple questions from the audience. Um, I have two questions. The first, uh, how was it decided, uh, the first question is, how was it decided that it would be an Alexa and not an Alex? And my second question, it's about the privacy Alexa page that you know you had to do in Europe. Did you also decide to send it to the American consumers? Yeah, uh, on the latter one, yes. We've, uh, we're just in the process of rolling that out everywhere, but the Alexa page will be global. We just thought it was the right thing by customers, so that's an easy one. Uh, why did we pick Alexa versus Alice? Uh, there's, there's the, the first and most important thing was what, what wake word that, we, that felt human could we, the wake word's the word Alexa. You might, you're familiar with other ones. There's like, hey Siri and okay Google. Uh, and so for us, we didn't want to put, we could, the easier one to do would have been hey Amazon. When you have multiple words and you have some hard consonants like a Z and a, and a Y or, and, and a Y in there, they're, they're not phonetic uh, words that get misunderstood very often in the English and other languages, and so that's easier to model. Uh, but we wanted, to, we wanted to make it more personal, as I talked about a personality, and so we were looking for a word that was very personable, and Alexa has a hard X in it, and it turns out that Alexa uh, is also not, uh, when you look at it phonetically throughout the corpus of where we, were, where we started, the English language, it, it doesn't get misrepresented by a lot of other things, and so it, it led to uh, it led to that uh, sort of. We had multiple choices, but that was our finalist, and one one out. Let's take one more. Just to follow on that, but there's a whole there's a whole gender implication of this. Yeah, she. Uh, she it's a she. Uh, so the uh, the number one thing there, we do uh, we have male and female voices. Uh, we surface those through our AWS service, which is called, uh, uh, which is our text-to-speech service through uh, through AWS. And the the real and there could have been bias in this. I'm the first person to say that. You you don't know if there was unconscious bias this, but when we tested both male and female uh, on the very early prototypes of Alexa it, uh, or of Echo, it was so clearly that uh, people reacted better to a female persona than a male persona. And w again, the data was uh, unbelievably clear. I'm, again, I'm the first person to say there could have been unconscious bias in, how, in that, but uh, that led to the decision to, to make it female. Great. Well, thank you. I do appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for the time. Yeah, sure. Right, good to see you.